and we set up a thing called the DSDM Consortium with two of our competitors. And that was one of the feeds, three feeds into the Agile Manifesto along with XP and Scrum. Now, it is reasonably significant because it was three British companies in a pub one night over dinner. We didn't need a week in a ski resort. <laughs> Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Hello and welcome to another show. I'm so excited today. I know, Marcus, you are incredibly excited today because we have with us Dave Snowden, one of the world's greatest experts on knowledge management and complexity, father of the Kinefin framework, which we love talking about. And uh, Dave's been on the, the show before, but it's good to have you back again, Dave. Welcome. Yeah, pleasure to be with you guys again. Thank you. You know, last time you were here, Dave, we we, we dove deep into the Kinefin framework, and uh, and we'll put a link in the show notes to that episode. But we really only only begun the journey of understanding the work that you've done in this area. Uh, there's a lot more to it than just the Kinefin framework. And, and one of the things that we didn't talk about is estuarine mapping, which is such an interesting term. What is what is estuarine mapping? I know. I had to go and check up when uh, I heard about that. Fascinating stuff. Well, yeah, yeah, enjoy it. Well, it's got an English name. We're thinking about renaming it in Welsh to join Kinevin. But there are... <laughs> <laughs> there is a first language Welsh speaking dispute going on about which Welsh word for estuary we use because we have several. Um, so, and they're masculine and feminine as well, which makes a difference. So, this actually comes from can, originally was inspired by constructor theory and physics, um, which, to be clear, is not the same thing as constructional law. So, constructional law comes from thermodynamics, it talks about flow, it talks about direction. Constructor theory comes from quantum mechanics, from Deutsch's work. And it's the first attempt in physics to try and deal with systems as a whole, rather than finding the smallest possible particle and then trying to make it even smaller. So summarizing a complex set of ideas, you can look this stuff up. They fundamentally say, what are the counterfactuals? Now, this is a use of counterfactual, which isn't a counter story. It's something which can't happen. Right. Yeah, so the laws of gravity can't change. Yeah, so that's called the counterfactual. So you start by identifying those. You then identify constructors. And constructors are things which are producing replicable outcomes. All right. So you put something in, it goes through a transformation. And I don't mean an agile transformation, which is a bad thing to even attempt, to be honest. I mean, it goes <laughs> through some sort of change, physical change. Right. Um, and the basic argument of constructor theory is that whatever has the lowest energy gradient will win. Mm -hmm. So if you have it, because evolution tends to that. And their actual uh, Deutsche wrote a really brilliant article explaining evolution from the point of view of energy cost rather than survival of the fittest, which is actually, I think, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But my background's in physics and philosophy, so I tend to prefer that discipline anyway. So either way, I came but it across does that seven or eight years ago. It mm -hmm. does. And it yeah. milled around in my head for a bit. Um, actually came across it at the um, How the Light Gets In, which is this big festival of music and philosophy and science, oh, which wow. takes place every year in Hay on Wye. I've heard about I'll that. I'll be there again next week. Actually, we're starting again next week. Milled it around for a bit. And then we I wrote the European Union Field Guide on how to manage in complexity in a crisis, along with Alessandro and some other co-authors. And yeah, in that, we identified constraint mapping as a key thing in complexity. So that links with Gerara's work. Um, her new book on constraints is coming out on November, so she might be worth you getting in touch with. Right? Um, and we've always talked about enabling constraints and governing constraints within the Canadian framework. So the argument in the field guide is stop trying to talk about what you want the system to look like start with what the hell the constraints are and which you can change. 
so you can see the synergy. Right. So we played around with that a bit, and normally it takes me about five to six years to work out a new method set in theory, and then three to four years in practice, which is why I get really angry with people who throw together an entire framework based on what they half remember of their three previous projects. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making too many references to say who would ever do that, that? Wonderful. all right um this one actually has taken off in four months wow and i think one of the reasons wow. is and you know it's taken a bit of development but what we do is we start off by saying look there are two things we can actually map constraints and constructors so at its simplest level constraints contain or they connect yeah, so if something is contained, it's an ordered system in Kinevin terms, you can see its boundaries. Sure. If it's connected, then it's a complex system, you haven't got clear boundaries and yeah, it's much more dissolute. Yeah. Um, and then constructors can transform either by passage or by encounter. So that the second is more like a catalyst. Hmm. And we've got other metaphors we can use as well, but that's the basic. So either in mass software capture or in brainstorm. We stop people talking about what should happen and we get them to identify the constraints and constructors. They then put those onto a grid, which the vertical dimension is energy cost of change. The horizontal dimension is physical time to change. And then of course, everything top right on that is a counterfactual space. Realistically, it isn't gonna change. And we've now added a liminal line to that, which means we can't change this, but somebody else might be able to. And that's actually been quite interesting working with senior, with sea level. If you give them an estuarine map and say, your people say this stuff can't be changed. They say, well, of course it can. Why haven't they asked? That's actually quite a common response. Right. Yeah. I, I um, love this, Dave, because <laughs> I see that. it's cool. So th th two seconds and I'll finish, all right? Sure. Um, bottom left is high volatility stuff. It can, it can turn on dime. Mm -hmm. And what you then do is you focus on that map, you create monitors for the boundary conditions, then you focus on either reducing the energy cost or increasing it, reducing the time or increasing it. And you take lots of small actions like that, and that changes the landscape so that you can then achieve a more significant change. So in a one sentence summary, you start by actually managing the dispositional state so that good things are more likely to happen before you put a lot of effort into what those should be. The reason I really like this, Dave, is because one of the things that that, that I am constantly saying in our classes and, and to clients, as Marcus knows, is that a lot of times people confuse complexity with difficulty. You know, there yeah, are big uh, there are there are simple problems that are very hard to do. They're not complex though. They're not even complicated. They're just hard. They require a lot of energy to your point. And, and people then, I feel, give themselves a pass on tackling them by saying, oh, this is so complex, we can't tackle this. Now, I'll give you my, my biggest example, which is probably the most controversial thing I can step on here. And you may disagree with me on this, but gun control in the United States. You know, we're, we're now have exceeded 200 mass shootings in this country this year. We aren't even, you know, halfway through the year. And you people... Have one, you've had one a week on average for the past decade. Yes. And it's going up and the severity is going up. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, and people get very upset when I say this, that I ask them, what what sort of problem on the... We're on the Kniffin framework. Does, does, does stopping gun violence... Uh, and mass killings lie. And people always say, oh, it's it's a complex problem. And I say, it's a simple problem. We've made it complex because of politics, because of, of culture and things like this. But every other country in the world has figured out how to deal with this. So it's not a complex problem at base. You simply you simply take away, you know, military weapons from the hands of people who, who aren't in the military, you know, and people get very upset when I say this. But I think that, that what you're just talking about goes into that because the work of actually dealing with it, at least in the United States, requires more energy than anyone's willing to spend, more political capital, more effort. And therefore, they say, oh, it's just too complex. We can't solve this problem. So let's not do anything about it. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, I, I actually agree. I think the solution is known. Yeah. 
um, after Dunblane in the UK or after the shooting um, in Tassie in Australia. Yeah. And I think this is key to astro mapping. The dispositional state of the British and Australian population was such that a draconian ban on guns wasn't just acceptable, not doing it was unacceptable. Yeah. Now, I think that that was important. And we don't just ban military weapons. We ban all weapons, except in a licensed gun club under, under lock and key, apart from farmer shotguns. And, you know, we're starting to realize we haven't got enough control over those, given some of the misuse. Right? But, the, but then you've got this very complex history. So I think the dispositional state around the problem in the States is highly complex. Yes. Yeah, and that means that the simple solution can't be followed. Right. Um, and so what you have to do is to look, well, actually, what are the constraints? What are the constructors? Now, one of the constraints is whichever amendment you decided should allow people to carry around very inaccurate arms, which couldn't really do too much damage except on mass, which has now been used for high velocity rifles and everything else. Right. So that's one. Yeah. yeah? And that's, that ties into a very strong libertarian tradition, both to the left and the right in the US and antagonism towards government. So you can start to map out what the various constraints and constructors are. And then you can start to look at how do I change those rather than how do I solve gun control because that's too big. Right. It's how do I change the dispositional state so a solution to gun control could emerge more effectively. And Absolutely. if you think about it, it's how we manage teenagers. It's what I've always said about Kinevin. You, you, you don't try and manage things by objectives. You manage things by changing the way the buggers interact or stopping certain types of interaction. And you move things in different ways or you create viral infection. Yeah. yeah. The other interesting thing I think to do on this is one of the things where I mean, I'm going to be in D.C. in um, November. And one of the things we're thinking about, because I've got links with Quantico and elsewhere, mm -hmm. is actually running this for Red Bull teaming. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the military environment, you want to see the energy gradient from the enemy's point of view as well as from yours. Yes, definitely. And actually running those as a red-blue team becomes very effective because it shows you weak points, common assumptions. It's going to reveal strategic weaknesses, etc. And I would do the same on that. I'd run SDRI mapping from an NRA point of view. Yeah, run it from a liberal democratic point of view, run it from a country conservative Republican point of view. I, you know, take the different tribes of America and they're becoming more clearly defined these days mm -hmm. um, and run the s map across each of those tribes and see where they are and where the commonalities and where the differences are. You know, the red-blue teaming aspect of this that you're talking about is interesting because I would guess that if you did an s map of the Ukrainians and the Russians right now, mm -hmm. it would reveal quite a bit about the difference in energy on both sides and, and how that feeds it into would. what's going on in the battlefield. And they've got an ideological component as well. So mm -hmm. you, you need to read Putin Putin's mentor on the concept of Rus. Yeah. I mean, very few people in the West actually know the degree to which he was right-wing Russian Orthodox during the Stalinist period or the post-Stalinist yeah. period. And the concept of Greater Rus, by which the Ukraine and Belarus are part of Rus. Yeah. yeah. And that's informing his policy. You add all sorts of other things. So to me, s mapping is a complexity alternative to root cause analysis. Yeah, the, the principle is the same, but it doesn't make the mistake of linear causality. Yeah, and a lot of times we find, because yeah. you know, we teach Toyota's five whys, there's a lot, there's a big problem mm. with that because often it's not, it, there isn't a, a, a single cause. In a complex adaptive system, there's very few linear causes, is there? And that's why the yeah, branch mapping that we do in this estuarine mapping really shows you much it does, more variety. Remember, that's a general problem. Cause. Most most methods and yeah. tools originate in manufacturing, yeah, which is a closed system. Yeah, and you know, if you look at the agile community, they still see software as a manufacturing process. Yes, and do, that's indeed. where a lot of the problems come from. So. Yeah, you know, business process uh -huh. re-engineering worked perfectly in a manufacturing environment. It was totally crap in a service environment. Yeah, and so that's the problem. We get all these developments in a highly controlled, closed system, and then people try to generalize them. They don't realize they're in a different space. Yeah, and that's, I mean, there, there's so much about not just, just business, but society 
that has 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 evolved or devolved from this this kind of Taylorism and you know things like that. And no, 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 don't blame Taylor. They, they, no. they, they, this is a common agile mistake. Um, Taylor actually got it right. Okay. Well, when when people blame talk about Taylorism, they're actually talking about systems dynamics and systems thinking post the nineteen nineties with business process re-engineering control. Taylor actually humanizes the workplace okay. compared with what went before. If you look at it, and he actually doesn't get rid of apprentice models, he's got a high ethical tone to what he's trying to do. It's not all about efficiency, and he only measures things which can be measured. Yeah, right. The real problem hits us in the 90s. It doesn't hit us in the 20s. I mean, I got, I got mm -hmm. picked up on that by Drucker and beaten up for my sins. So <laughs> I have the scars of being beaten up by Peter Drucker on this, and I have to agree he was right. Okay? I, I think last time you so were, I think you, were on, main... you told me he left you in a pool on the floor of a hotel. <laughs> a pool of humiliation and decided I was worthy of rescue and took me out for dinner and we talked together, all right? But I, I think that is a mistake people don't realize that they're, 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 they're talking about the wrong sort of thing, right? But what you saw, and if you look at it, Taylor actually comes off a military model of the organization. Mm -hmm. And yes. military models are actually quite adaptive. Whereas what happens with business process re-engineering, it comes off an engineering model of the organization. And engineering models are never adaptive because they want yeah. closed system with defined goals, with defined purposes. They want to optimize flows. And then, of course, you get Goldrack comes along with theory of constraints. And Goldrack uses the word complex and complicated interchangeably. He uses them as synonyms yeah, mm -hmm. because that's when he's writing. But again, people therefore see constraints as things to be removed, when actually often constraints are things to put in place. And that's definitely a military thing. We often impose constraints. You know, Dave, yeah. I have a question for you. This is this is an interesting question you raise. So you know, my 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 first book was was American Icon and, and about Alan Mulally's business mm -hmm. plan review process. And I don't know if you've had if you've looked at his process much, but you know, he was. I make this point in the book. You know, he was an aerospace engineer, and the BPR process was an aerospace engineer's solution to to the problem of how to run. Mm -hmm a large global organization. So it was very much an yeah. engineering solution. What do you think of his BPR process, if you've looked at it? Um, BPR suffered with Hammer and Chamfrey. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you went back to its origins in aerospace, and if you went back to Tom Davenport writing that up, if BPR had come from that, not from Hammer and Chamfrey, it would have been better. Hammer and Chamfrey very cynically created it as a highly structured recipe. And they were that cynical, if you, if you actually read the history of how they did it. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think, again, there's nothing wrong with that. So it's like 3M, all right? So 3M adopted Six Sigma. Right. Yeah? Now, Six Sigma mm -hmm. is what happened when BPR didn't work. And there are two solutions when BPR doesn't work. One is to say, hang on a minute, maybe it doesn't work over here. And the other is, oh, let's just do it harder and it might work this time, which is what Six Sigma was about. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, 3M threw it out in all by core manufacturing. Yep. Because it was destroying their capacity to innovate. And I think this is the Kinevin yes. principle is different things work in different contexts. Right. And a linear flow so efficiency true. model only works in a closed system where you know what the output has got to be. All right. In a service environment or in the modern competitive environment, you don't know that. And then we come on to a key thing, all right? So if, if you've ever seen, I need to draw this, but most assessments of risk, for example, are done on the basis of a historical study. Mm -hmm. And then we make things fit into a bell curve or a Gaussian distribution. Yeah? And that's where we create laws and rules and processes. Yeah, We assume we can eliminate the tails of the distribution. The trouble is if you do a double log scale of size against frequency of any human phenomena, yeah, you get a straight line called a power law. And if you overlay that Pareto approach over an Gaussian approach, the tails are very fat, so you can't disregard them. So in the center of both, you've got repetition between past and future. Mm -hmm. So you can use the past to determine what you do in the future. In the tail of a Pareto distribution, you haven't got a significant correlation between past and future. So actually rules are very dangerous. What you have to do is to create processes which allow real-time decision-making. Now, that's actually something else we're working on at the moment, is distributing decision-making to combinations of roles 
not to people, which is a military concept. Yes. If you think about it, I can delegate to, to three people in different roles and know they'll make good decisions. Yeah, and we're now doing things like one of the roles is anonymous, so nobody knows who it is if we're allocating money. So that allows me to actually distribute decisions into the field under conditions of extreme uncertainty and not work out in advance what the solution would be. And BPR and Six Sigma don't comply with that because they want to work out in advance what the solution would be. Mm -hmm. And that's fine in a lot of circumstances, but in these extreme levels of uncertainty, you need a process for real-time decision-making. But critically, it's one of the fundamental principles of complexity management. Yeah. You need to work with very finely grained objects. So lots of small situations, lots of small decisions, because then you can afford more failure. Um, you're less impactful and you're not committing too much resource mm -hmm. early. And when things start to work, you can then reinforce quickly. And again, that's what SDRI mapping is about. Oh, and by the way, we did a lot of work. So micro on failure. Yeah. It, so you're having multiple micro failures rather than macro, which is right, hugely so detrimental. We did an SDRI map for one of the big car companies and their partners on an aspect of electrical cars. Yeah? We ended up with 40 micro actions, not one grand strategy. Interesting. And we end up with mm -hmm. complete consensus on those actions, whereas before they've been arguing about the strategy. So if you if you move the granularity down, thing. you can get agreement very quickly. And then you can see yeah, what works or doesn't work, and then you can start to put energy in again. And it's all this change the dispositional state before you try and achieve objectives. Oh, and by the way, don't waste time on counterfactuals. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is a big one. And, the big and that goes back to the thinking. systems as a whole. Systems thinking keeps defining an ideal future state and closes the gap. It doesn't first take account of what future states are even possible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's so interesting. So right. You know, this is, this is, uh, um, I think this is something that's so important because one of the things that I get frustrated by is that a lot of times, you know, there's the whole, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make it drink thing to, to the work that we do mm -hmm. where you, you work with large organizations and and you help them see a clear way forward and they they see it and they agree to it and it's just too it's too hard to do and so they just they just double down on what they've been doing you know i was working with a fortune 20 company and and they were obsessed with one of their competitors and and mm -hmm. i was i was training a red team in, in the organization they wanted the red team to work on how do we how do we defeat this competitor once and for all? And they they had a cup. They developed the, the, a couple of, of massive you know strategies that were were you know hundreds of millions of dollars strategies. And in the midst of 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 weighing these these two different strategies, the 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 team that I was leading had this epiphany where they said, you know what? I mean, we have enough cash on hand to simply buy them easily. Mm. So why are we get why are we betting hundreds of millions of dollars on a strategy that may or may not work? If we're really that obsessed with them, why don't we just buy them? And the answer of course was Take because it would it would it would eat into to to EPS earnings per share for for a few quarters and, and Wall Street wouldn't like it. And and so but we took it we took it to to the senior leadership and to the board and and they you know they they presented the case you know we we spent years trying to figure out how to put these people out of business we could simply buy them and and mm. everybody agreed yeah that that's that would be the intelligent thing to do but of course nobody wanted to to go and make that case to Wall Street but it's also I mean, you see that's one of the constraints I think people are, I mean I've seen again the agile community people people keep blaming C suite now I've been C level. 90% of the things that you know you should do, you know you can't do. Right. And it would be nice if for once people realized that was the environment in which you're working in, yeah? Because you've got all these different things to take account of. And again, that's what we're trying to do is sort of what's a counterfactual. Don't waste time on things which aren't. But, you know, in, in competitive strategy, you, you don't want one massive, great multi-million dollar strategy. You want lots and lots of small things to see how the compare and it's a military thing. You, you want to see how the competitor responds. You want to identify their weaknesses, their strengths. You want to see what you want to do in a good competitive strategies. I mean, IBM did this brilliantly in positioning Amdahl as an alternative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they need competition in the mainframe market. You, you can't survive without some competition. 
This goes back yeah, to Bismarck. You know, simultaneous pursuit yeah. of diverse options. Mm-hmm. I think the other and the other thing we are noticing with complexity at the moment, and this is flexure skills in my terms, which is life cycle. Up until COVID, we were selling to enthusiasts, so we we had to explain the theory and how we did it. Post COVID, we're not doing that anymore. We're telling people what we can do for them, and they're not fussed about how we do it. And that's a flip. It, it happens in markets. Yeah. Yeah. It happened with systems thinking back in the 80s and 90s. And it's happened with complexity now. Hmm. So the, the danger, to be honest, at the moment in complexity at the moment is the world and his wife are saying their methods are complex. And all they're doing is taking some sort of fairly rotten fresh, spraying it with aerosol and wrapping it in some fancy cover, which they don't understand and selling the same old thing yet again. Right. No reference to major consultancies intended yet. Oh, please, please intend it, because, you know, we, we have no problem uh, <laughs> teeing off on major consultancies. <laughs> I'm being British. We we use irony a lot, all right? Yes. <laughs> I'm being American. We're blunt and, and don't have subtlety. <laughs> it, it was an unfair tactic, actually. When I was working in IBM, every time we got really pissed off with an American vice president, we used to put irony on in HTML characters in a parallel chat. <laughs> all get ironic for 20 minutes and then turn it off and it confused the hell out and they never knew what was going on <laughs> see see this is this is my my secret marcus will tell you my, my secret superpower is that i was raised by monty python so <laughs> nah, okay he's well yeah. aware he's that was well out aware. when i was at school and i still remember the physics teacher coming in one day and saying now for something completely different <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, he still doesn't understand why the class didn't recover for about 30 minutes. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great stuff. Well, you know what? Why don't we take a short break? And when we come back, I, I know Marcus uh, are, wants to, to delve into Agile more. So, so we'll talk about that. And I'll mm-hmm. talk about some of, some, of, some of your work in other areas as well. Stay tuned. Hey, folks, Bryce here. If you're listening to this and you're liking what you're hearing and you're wondering, am I a red team thinker? We have an easy way for you to find out. Just go to the show notes, click on the link there to our free assessment to find out if you are a red team thinker and what you can do to think more effectively, to lead more effectively, and to make better decisions faster in your complex world. Like I said, the link is in the show notes, or you can simply go to our website, redteamthinking.com. Check it out. I can't wait to see how you score. So welcome back. Great conversation during the break. Dave, I'd like to talk to you about Agile. I'd like your perspective on it. It's quite prolific. We've seen online and also what rewilding Agile means. Yeah, it's interesting. I was in software development for years. And one of the things, I was one of the three companies, I was strategy director in data sciences. And we set up a thing called the DSDM consortium with two of our competitors. And that was one of the feeds, three feeds into the Agile manifesto along with XP and Scrum. Now, it is reasonably significant because it was three British companies in a pub one night over dinner. We didn't need a week in a ski resort. But also we did it between competitors. Yeah. We didn't try and make it a proprietary standard. We made it a non-proprietary approach. And to to me, that's important and it's related to it. I then moved into strategy and development and out to software a bit. And then the XP community in London London, asked me to give it a Kinevin talk. And that was where Kinevin took off in Agile, was Mm -hmm. from that. Um, And it was interesting. It was the XP community who brought me in. And with all... You know, due respect to Alistair, this is his phrase, I'm using it slightly differently. XP was always the heart of Agile. Um, It was really what Agile was meant to be about, I think, if you go back on that. Um, The trouble is that Scrum, to use Blaster's term, was at the right level of abstraction and codification that it could diffuse very quickly. So because of that, Agile started to be defined by Scrum and also by the Scrum business model yeah, of certification, right? And of course, then everybody else follows that model. And then we get the sort of evil stuff, which is safe, which is everybody else's ideas bundled into an engineering diagram. And if you want a certificate in something, Dean will sell you one, all right? I mean, that that's the way safe works. 
Um, and I said this at the Lean Agile conference in Scotland where we met. And I remember you know, the, the, the XP people were cheering me. So I thought they needed to be put in a place. And I said, the trouble is you guys can't talk to ordinary mortals. So what you did was never going to scale anyway. And they're still trying to work out whether that was an insult or not. I think they think it's a compliment. <laughs> um, so we, we need to realize Agile's now got into what's called the commodification phase. The minute SAFE came along, I remember sitting at a conference in Novi Sad when I first came across it, right? And I wrote an angry blog post then called The Infantilization of Management, which it took me 10 minutes to write it, and it's still viral today. Um, but the other argument I made is fundamentally what SAFE meant was that Agile had become a commodity. And in market life cycle terms, when something becomes a commodity, that's when you introduce novelty, because then the market's ready. Yeah. So we're sort of thinking about that around the rewilding concept. So rewilding is not to return to its original state in nature. It's to actually restore balance in the system. Yeah, so you can't go back to the starting point of Agile. That's, that's actually a Welsh word for that called hiriaith, which is a nostalgic looking back to a past which never really existed, yeah, which is a lovely word. Right? Um, but you can rebalance yes. it. So our work on that is many and various. So we, we, we're doing three separate things, initiatives on this. Two are ours and, and one is open source public. Yeah. So we're looking very strongly at how do you define what you produce in the first place? Because the trouble is all of the agile methods assume that there is somebody who can define the output up front. And the trouble is that's always limited in what it's, they're doing. So we've created methods like entangled trios. We've also, we're now mapping unarticulated needs because if you can use existing technology to actually deal with an unarticulated need, you can move yourself forward much faster than waiting for traditional definitions. So that's one thing we're doing. And that's fairly well advanced now with three or four complete method sets, which are open source with supporting software, et cetera. And the idea on that is not to replace something like Scrum, but to better feed the backlog with better data. So I'll give you one illustration on that. Um, we'll put together, instead of sending out a systems analyst to do interviews, we'll put together somebody older who sees the system as a whole, so a tester or a systems architect, with a young, bright coder, together with a user trained to talk to IT people. And we're about to make that training public. It's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than train IT people to understand users. And we then throw 20 of those trios at a problem for three, a month and see what they come up with. And that's a complex technique. So instead of having one person come in with one set of assumptions and interview people, you run lots of small things in parallel and that improves your feed into the backlog. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing, right? The, the bigger one I'm looking at at the moment, and this is also, we're looking at this in terms of project management, is a complex approach to architecture where, and this isn't yet fully developed. This has got a few more years on the theory front before we really start to push it out, right? But it's based around the biological concept of scaffolding, right? And there are different types of scaffolding in nature or medicine is another one. So for example, there's a nutrient lattice they'll put over a burn on your hand, which gradually dissolves, which creates a structure for the skin to regrow, but dissolves nutrients into the skin as it does. So that's a type of scaffolding. Yeah. So what we're looking at is an architecture of scaffolding with objects. And sorry, I was on Corbett committees back in the 80s. So I still have a passion for object orientation. And I always said back then, people are objects too. We shouldn't just see software as objects. People in different combinations have input, output, polymorphism, inheritance. So then an application becomes an emergent property of the interaction of objects in or around the scaffolding structure. And that's a very different approach to architecture because it creates an eco ecology rather than a series of manufacturing processes. And then the big open source thing we're doing, which is genuinely open source, it's got its own brand. We we pledged to make it independent. We're driving it, but uh, we're there. And we got two major scrum groups on board. We got the Kanban groups. We got DevOps on board. We got most of the agile community on board is to effectively create kits which break the frameworks and the methods down to their lowest coherent unit. 
so that people can then combine and recombine methods and tools from different from different proprietors. So you could, for example, peel a sprint out of Scrum and replace it with a three month time box. Still work, different context, right? Now that's got a lot of traction. As I say, you know, the two big Scrum orgs are both creating cards for it. Without Safe, I don't think that would have happened. But what it does is it means you can create context specific solutions, but you're using predefined modules. You're not making everything uncertain. This isn't bespoke, this isn't start from scratch. It's pre-assembly of different components that you can put together in different combinations on different days. And that to me is the next big move because that breaks the tyranny of framework wars. And it's a sort of best of breed type approach or a contextual best of breed. It also, by the way, all of those and things. And is this the method kits? Yeah, and we're, we're doing that not just for Agile, we're doing it for foresight and for strategy and for organizational change. So there's a whole body of stuff on this. But everything has a QR code. The QR code always, go back, always goes back to the originator of the method. Right? And that's principle, right? So right. this is not taking other people's ideas and putting them all together and charging certification schemes for it. And there's two or three people doing that at the moment. Yeah, It's actually saying mm -hmm. you want to go back to the people who created these things because they understand them. But you need to be able to pick a mix. I don't know if we have that phrase in the States or not. No. Okay, it's, it's British supermarket. You date your kids and there's this battery of sweets, all right? So they pick a mix. They're not forced to buy one. They ah. pick two from here, one from there, and they're all put in a bag. That we call pick a mix. Yeah. Yeah. And you're trying to get into that approach. Yeah? We call it we call that it a Chinese, Chinese restaurant method. You know, one from column A, one from column B, one from column <laughs> okay. C. Yeah. Not knowing you guys without a racist over <laughs> <right? Um, laughs> uh, That's America for you. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So yes, I mean, for us, we think that's important because that also allows the rapid generation of new methods because you don't have to create a free, free, complete framework anymore. We're actually creating a, a lucky dip approach. So people, yeah. the standards are open. Anybody can produce their own or they can send us a file and we'll create them for them. Yeah, And they can decide how much markup they want. It's their choice. We're, we're being completely agnostic about this. But we're also creating a pack where if somebody's got a favorite yeah, method or tool that. or a quote, they can put it in. And once we get 50 of them, we'll put them in a random pack and sell that. Mm -hmm. wow. So we're trying to create a much richer ecosystem. I, I think that's essential. Yeah. Well, that's exactly it, isn't it? It's an ecosystem. And that's where so many organizations are failing because they're trying to hitch the horse to one wagon. It's like, mm -hmm. this is the way we're going to follow this strict method. And it doesn't work. As you said, dealing with complexity, you can't have one tool, one weapon, You've got to have that smorgasbord, that pick and mix, and choose the right thing. Yeah, that people, and you've got to respect so often the original struggle nature. to choose the right thing. I mean, I, I've had people who say that you know that they they criticise Scrum for telling people that what they're doing isn't Scrum because it's not in the Scrum Guide. They're not getting it right. They're not saying you can't do things which are different. They're saying just don't call it Scrum if you do hmm. them. All right, and I exactly. think that's the point. I mean, yeah, I've had people adapt Kinevin left, right, and centre for all sorts of reasons. And I never object because it's what I did with Brasso's iSpace to create Kinevin, but I never claimed I had Brasso's mm -hmm. iSpace. All right. So, and I think that's the principle. It's, it's mo most creators are not afraid of people modifying what they do or adding to it, but they don't want to be held responsible or have what that person did attributed to them. Yeah. And I think, I think yeah, people Frankenstein's get that Frankenstein's monster appears. That, that, that's yeah. really interesting. That's actually, this is, I, I mentioned during the break, there was something I wanted to talk to you about it. And this is what gets into it. You know, one of the things that, that we struggle with, that I struggle with is, you know, keeping things proprietary versus just opening them up to everybody um, and, and making them part of something that people can iterate on. One of the things that holds me back from doing that is, is dilution. And the concern that people will will take some of the stuff that I've I've developed and use it in a wrong way and and give it a bad name and me, and I'm just curious your thoughts well, on done that, that because right? haven't we? I think you checked on the in, on the net recently. Yeah, I mean I've seen more abuse of red blue team than anything else. Right? Yeah, I know. Um, but you you I mean, you haven't been afraid of that. How how have you dealt with that with your work? Um, I think, well, two or three things. All right. One is it's going to happen. Right? 
So the issue is to make sure yeah, that can't what stop it. Yeah, to, to make sure you just and, and don't go too too paranoid about it, all right? Mm. So I don't get too fussed if people start off with a two by two version of Kinevin. It's kinda of like okay, leave it for a bit, correct it. Mm. Yeah, mildly mention that you can't have five quadrants, which is normally a you know, takes people a time to work out, but the amount of people who do talk about the quadrants of Kinevin then there's five, all right? Um and also develop what you're doing so there is a latest version which is clearly yours. And you can develop it faster than people who are copying you because they don't understand the principles. And we found that, I mean, people have tried to copy our software. There have been three attempts to copy our software. And, I mean, the legal cost of defending this stuff, I never want to go into that again. I'm not going to do it again, to be honest, because people who copy stuff, they don't really understand it anyway. So they're just copying the way you're doing it at one point in time. So I think there is getting more relaxed about that. But I think also what the Hexi kits will do, and I was going to talk to you guys about this anyway, yeah. it allows you to introduce revenue teaming into Agile very quickly and into other disciplines by creating a kit. And the kit always points to you as the originator, so it's easier for people to use the kit and come back to you than to take somebody's copy of what you do. So for me, this is also an IP defense move Yeah, hmm. in, in that sense. Uh, sorry, one last comment. Now, yeah. I now have a policy of publish class that so you can always prove origination. And the amount of people, and I get really, I get really pissed off. So people go back. You quote your sources. People go back to their sources. Obviously, copy what you did, and said they haven't copied it because they read the same material. It's just an accidental coincidence. We got a lot of that as well. Yeah. Moment. Either way, the way hexi kits work is that you say you you have different components. You have methods. You have tools. You have principles, you have roles, you have quotations. We've got a set of categories you can put things in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you take your method set, you break it down to its lowest coherent units. And for each of that, we create a hexi. And the reason we use a hexi shape is tessellation. People put hexes together in novel combinations. They don't do that with playing cards. Right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's the beehive mentality. Mm hmm. So what happens then is, you know, I brainstorm the problem, I put the hexes on the table, I brainstorm the problem, I label the clusters, I decide what I'm going to do. And I say, okay, so how am I going to achieve this? Right, well, on another table, I've got all my methods laid out. And this actually acts as a form of augmented memory because you don't remember things unless you use them frequently, but the cards are augmented memory. I say, well, hang on a minute, I can use that method here. So you put that method on that problem. But in order to do that, I need to collect data. Well, I'll use these methods to collect data. So you start to build these combinations. Yeah. And then we have transparent overlays, which say, well, when I get to this stage, I'll think again because I might have got it wrong or this is dangerous. Yeah. And we have quotable quotes. We have warnings. We're, we're working with um, Comic Agile and Gaping Void to actually create packs of their cartoons. So you can put awesome. the cartoons onto your assembly to make a point of what you want to avoid. And interestingly, we do all this horizontally, not vertically. So we found that horizontal mm -hmm. facilitation on thin tables, you get more participation. And so basically that's how it works. And then once you've finished it, you take a picture, that's what you're gonna do. At some stage, we'll put different types of readers into that so we can automate it, but that's downstream, yeah? And so you end up with these so series of threads of what you're gonna do from different sources. And if you're in a big company, and this is another market, you're doing a big organizational change or an agile transformation, you can basically come to us and say, well, I want to use you know, these methods from these suppliers, and we'll put them together as a unique kit along with your corporate values. And you can issue that to all of your change agents. I love that. So that Be radically reduces the cost of consistency. Yeah. I love that, Dave, because you know this gets into something that I've, that I've been... I, I've stressed since I, since my, my red teaming book came out, which is that to tell people, you know, this is not a methodology, you know, mm -hmm. this is, this is a, a set methodology of tools. is a study of methods anyway. <laughs> there you go. But th this is not even a method then this is a set of, this is a toolkit and, and yeah. it, it is not, it's not something that is a, is a contained ecosystem. It's something that you can, use with mm -hmm. what other with whatever strategy development tools you're using things yeah. like this and and I think that's important because well I I think that 
particularly in large organizations, leaders want something that they can pull off and say, this is it. We're going to do what's in this box and nothing else. And it's going to solve all of our problems, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, silver bullet box. Yeah, and this is kind of like a halfway house because the leaders are familiar with the components. So you're putting the components together in different combinations. It's far less right. threatening. Exactly. Particularly if the company is approved. So are you, are you finding that's more receptive? We approve, how you assemble them is unique to your context. Well, you know, this is interesting because when I was writing my last book, um, my publisher, you, 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 you write, but you know how, you know, they, you submit chapters as you're going through and my publisher about two thirds of the way through said, you know, I assume at some point you're going to have a red teaming roadmap that shows how someone should take something and which tools to use in which order. And I, I said, no. I said, I said, I'm not because it's different. You know, I, I use the analogy. I said, you know, it's like playing golf. You know what, you may know what club you're going to grab first, but after you hit the ball that you're, you're, you don't know where you're going to land. You're going to make your decision based on that. And they really resisted that. My publisher was like, people want a roadmap that they can print out. And I said, if they print out a roadmap, then they're not thinking. The whole point of this is to get people to think. If they're just following a roadmap. It's going to be different for everything. I like this. This is like a way of creating a roadmap on a case by case basis. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, part of the basis of this, by the way, was a game called Settlers of Catalan. Oh, yeah. Familiar with that. In Settlers, you, you have to, and this is Astra, and you have to construct the board before you play the game. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. that's a risk reduction technique. So you don't just comply with what the big consultancy is taking you as a formula they're doing with all of your competitors. Because actually competitive advantage comes from using standard things in different combinations. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Reusable. I love that. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. And that that allows I'm us building to build that foundation, that isn't it? So one one thing I mean, interesting, Estran has got two new applications which we haven't expected. Um one is as an alternative foresight technique. Whereas if you think, if you map the energy flows, you can say, well, what's got the lowest energy flow? That's actually what's going to happen. So that's got a lot of interest, right? The other one interesting is for the coaching market, for people to use an S-Drive map for where they are sitting personally for their own well-being. So they map the constraints and constructors in their life. They work with their coach. Yeah, and then they identify what they're going to do to increase the energy cost of bad things and reduce the energy cost of good things. And so they do small things which change habits over time much more effectively. So we mm -hmm. hadn't expected that, but I, I think it's back to physics being the universal, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you get back to the level of physics, you can basically take anything from them. I think it's a good model. I mean, I'm you know, biased I did... though, because I did, I did physics. So I said I did physics and philosophy at college. All right. So I did the foundation disciplines in the science and the arts. I know mathematicians think they're the foundation, but they're not. Yeah. I did so. philosophy and anthropology. I went in a different direction, but with the same dual, uh, dual focus. Mm -hmm. I think I philosophy is something that, you know, I, when I told my father I was going to be a philosophy major, I think, I, I think it was one of the darkest days of his life. Um, but I, <laughs> I, I think that philosophy is something that, if you take it seriously and you, and you sit with it, 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 it comes back and pays dividends to you later in life. Um, I find myself referring back to what I learned as a philosophy major more now than I ever have. Yeah. And I think also, it, it, I think if you study philosophy, you can pick up mostly the other humanities quickly. Yeah. So you can very quickly read into other disciplines and you learn to be cynical and the same is true of physics. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you've got the sort of core physics in your background, you can do that with most of the sciences. And I think the issue, I mean, one of the big issues for me is how do we create more generalists? And I don't buy this concept of the T-shaped generalist. I've never liked that. Yeah. Um, and now people are creating multiple different shapes because T-shaped has sold out and they're now trying to create a new fad. <laughs> but fundamentally, a generalist Cutting knows a little bit yeah. about a lot of things. If you're a deep specialist in one area, you're not a generalist. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, you, know, you may have a knowledge of other fields, but you're not a generalist. You'll always privilege that discipline. If you look at the Victorian age, there were a lot of the people who who 
were responsible for amazing inventions and amazing ideas were generalists. Mm -hmm. They were people who dabbled in a lot of different things. Well, if you look at the Royal Society in mm -hmm. Britain, all right, um, many members of the Royal Society were naval captains. Really? Because they were actually, oh, in the British Navy, they were very bright. I mean, the British Navy is always a meritocracy. And there are three examples of ordinary seamen who became admirals during the Napoleonic War, which would wow. never have happened in the army. Yeah. Yeah, they were actually press gangs, oh, you know, know. as farmer's sons. And, <laughs> but the way it worked is you'd get promoted in battlefield, but to get to be an officer, you had to pass a maths exam. And the maths exam was hard. Yeah. Well, and remember, the British Navy was set up by Elizabeth the first. All right. Sorry, I can't stand the Tudors. The Tudors were the Welsh revenge on the English conquerors. We'll give you this bunch of. <laughs> right? But Elizabeth couldn't afford a navy, so she actually licensed pirateers. And the British yeah. Navy was always based on piracy. It was licensed piracy. So mm -hmm. they, it was a meritocracy all right, in terms of the way it worked. Not sure how we got into this one, but um it, it's an interesting example, and it was heavily crew based and heavily dynamic based. Yeah, but the the point is that because they were mathematicians, they could study nature, and they had the time to do it. There's an interesting parallel at a, at a lower level, I would submit, to the U.S. Uh, air services, both the Army Air Force and, and and the Naval Air Forces at the beginning of World War II, because we didn't have a, near enough pilots in this country, and so they 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 took pilots based on aptitude test rather than requiring, mm. you know, college degree. Cause they needed people. My, my one of my uncles became a, a Navy pilot. He, you know, just went down, took a, a test on math and science and, and engineering and stuff and passed right out of high school and became a pilot. A lot of those pilots or a lot, you know, became officers and, and, and did things like, you know, you know, get into, to, uh, you know, the whiz kids in the, in the Army Air Force, you know, for, for instance, you know, pioneered a lot of the, the science of behind, you know, managing large organizations, statistical analysis and stuff like that. And so I think that there's I, I'm a huge believer that meritocracies are, are the key to unlocking the yeah, potential of any society. The, the RAF had something similar, but you could be a sergeant and a pilot if you were a flight sergeant. Yeah. And you were on the plane and piloting and a major was your navigator you were in charge when the plane was flying hmm interesting and that yeah, ability and, and that's actually quite interesting and you can see the same in the modern army a weapon sergeant has authority over a brigadier yeah. and there is rank. something it's fascinating if you look at the medical profession and the army they have these two strands they have people who are practical who then learn theory and people who start with the theory and then learn the practice yeah, so it's doctors, nurses, and the combination of the two is really powerful because they're different ways of acquiring knowledge. That's very true. The problem, in, at least on this side of the Atlantic, though, is meritocracy has become a dirty word. Yeah, well, lots of things become dirty words, and some things which we don't think are dirty now get you banned as a teacher and everything else, all right? It's like... I, I, I had to do scenarios on civil war in America a few years ago up on Powder Mountain. Yeah. And only Californians could make you do a major scenario planning exercise in unhygienic environments on tents and Salt Lake City, all right? But either way, we did it. The most realistic scenario we came up with was called the Gilead scenario. And this was seven years ago we did this. And the argument was if you are a blue voter in a red state, you'll be living in the city mm -hmm. and you won't want to stay there. So you'll move. So mm -hmm. blue will become bluer and red will become redder. And one day Gilead will mm -hmm. have formed. And you can kind of like see that happening to be it's honest. happening right now. I mean, I, yeah. I, I live in California. We, talk about that a lot, and, don't we? You know, we see that happening. Um, and the consequences of that are, are TBD. Yeah. And for that, I mean, it was interesting. I was at South by Southwest. Um, I didn't realize how big South by Southwest was. I was invited to speak. Huge. So I thought I could book a flight the week before and <laughs> discovered that I had to invoke American Airlines executive platinum status to have somebody thrown off a plane so I could have an economy seat. All right. So I felt slightly guilty about that. But somebody very senior in Austin, I won't say who, I said, how the hell do you survive in Texas? And he said, we're a blueberry in a red sea of blood. And I've never forgotten that phrase. And I turned down a teaching assignment in Texas last year because they sent me a manual 
on how not to offend your students. Now, I've never not offended a student in my life. And I said, why? And they said, well, because they're allowed to bring guns into the classroom. And it was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Welcome but to America. <laughs> Well, yeah, but I mean, Britain was like that. Britain was like that in the 19th century as well. I think people shouldn't get morally high turn on this. I mean, there is an old joke, if you don't know it, in Britain, all right, that we sent the criminals to Australia and the religious fanatics to the States. Yeah. And we know who got the better deal. Yeah. yeah. And the Australians think it's a joke against the Americans. The Americans think it's a joke against Australians. Actually, we're winding both of you up, all right? <laughs> you were both arc ships. That they, um, More irony. Um, yeah. Yes, indeed. Well, I always, but, I, 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 mean, I, will, I will tell you, one of the things I find fascinating is that when when the revolution broke out against uh, the monarchy and they went looking for Cromwell to to lead uh, the the uh, you know basically the, the the Christian version of of Salafis or Wahhabi uh, in, in the in the Islamic world today, Cromwell was in the process of packing to to move to the United States or to move to the colonies. <laughs> Yeah, and, and remember in your own civil war, I mean, you know, Lincoln tried to persuade the most successful Confederate general to lead the Republican troops. I mean, these are ambiguous periods in terms of the way it yeah. works, right? And I think we, we, we don't need to get precious about this. All societies go through good and bad periods, right? Um, Absolutely. What actually matters, and I think this is part of the problem with the internet and everything else, is actually if you have empathy, it breaks the, it breaks the ideology. So some of our work on peace and reconciliation, for example, is to find something that two people with very different ideologies actually share as a problem, to get them to work on that problem and not talk about their ideological differences. Let them have that conversation uh-huh. when they're ready for it. And I've been arguing this on several EU and other programs. We, we've got to start writing, trying to write better algorithms to sort out what's true or false. We've got to start connecting people much faster in smaller groups so that they actually realize other people are human. I mean, I spent three weeks doing field ethnography in Tea Party communities 15 years ago. And I remember going back to D.C. and saying, you guys have got these guys all wrong. They're socialists. I mean, I wouldn't have said that while I was there because I might not have got it alive, but actually right. they're socialists in practice. Yeah. And that's why they're confused mm-hmm. by what you're trying to do, because they look after their own people. They look after their community. Why are you doing this? And you're tackling this the wrong way. Yeah. And again, that's the granularity. But until you engage you with those get people, to find you know, a grain level yeah. so that you've got traction. We'll have to we'll have to have you back on, Dave, to talk about this because this is something that is so so important today. Honestly, I think this is the most important work you're doing. Um, I have recommended your e, EU manual to so many different people um, who are because in this country, as you know, um, in particular, people don't have empathy anymore, and they've lost the ability to disagree agreeably. And the roadmap and some of the tools that you that you outline in that book, and we'll put a link in the show notes, is so powerful. Um, you know, at a much you know much more micro level from what we normally talk about at large corporations and militaries and governments. I'm the chair of the planning committee in my community, and we have a lot of contentious issues that are kind of ripping the community apart around forest management and fire safety and things like that. And I have been bringing your work into it because I think it's so critical to helping people just be able to have conversations with each other and listen. Yeah. I think it's finely grained objects, distribute the, I mean, there's three principles, all right? You, you use finely grained things, smaller and smaller things. You distribute the interpretation to very diverse audiences and you get rid of any interpretive layers between the decision maker and the raw data. And if you do those three things, it actually works. And those are heuristics, yeah, not rules. Great stuff. That's what we're helping our teams do every day, aren't we? Thanks, Dave. It's such a pleasure talking with you. Love love having you on the Always show. Fun. Lot to think about. Yeah. Super interesting. Thank you, Dave. Thanks a lot. <laughs>